science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and a science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. Put on your lab coat, put on your safety glasses, and hold on to your tail. This is the Science Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. Our family's still riding high from the awesome event that we attended at the TELUS Science Center, where I got to talk about using dogs and kindness to teach science. And we got to interact with like so many people. I want to say hundreds, hundreds of people. Uh, it was a, a, such a cool, cool event, cool experience. And we're, we're still so thankful for the people that came to talk to us and listen to my discussion. Well, what's on the science podcast this week? In science news, we're going to look at a, <laughs> a black hole that's kind of close to us that was discovered not too long ago. And in pet science, we're going to take a look at a study that tried to reconstruct what a dog sees. Super cute. Hey dogs, why are robots so insecure? Well, they only have artificial intelligence. <laughs> okay, that one's so bad. On with the show, because there's no, there's no time like science time. This week in science news, let's talk about a black hole that's maybe a little bit too close for comfort. It's okay. The, the astronomers in this report made it very clear that we're not in any danger. So, but it's, it's pretty close and that's why this is making news. Pretty close when we consider the size of the universe. <laughs> it's not like you can hop in your car and drive to this black hole. Anyways, this comes from the Gemini North Telescope on Hawaii. It's one of the two telescopes that the International Gemini Observatory uses. And what they found was the lead of the story, the closest black hole ever discovered to Earth. Now, I wish they gave black holes interesting names, but they generally give it like a, a coordinate in the sky. At least this one has a normal start to it. They named the black hole Gaia BH1. It's only about 10 to 12 times more massive than our sun. And if you're wondering about how close it is, it's about 1,600 uh, light years away from us. A light year is how far light will travel in one year. And light moves really, really quickly. So you don't have to worry about this black hole. 1,600 light years away is much different than 1,600 miles or kilometers away. So, But it's three times closer to Earth than any other black hole that has ever been discovered. One of the cool things about this discovery is how they found the black hole. There is a black hole and a sun-like star that orbits the black hole. So the astronomers made the point that if you were to put the black hole where our star is and our sun where we are, that's the relative distance one from the other. Now, if you're wondering what would that black hole do to this companion star, you've got it. That's how they found this black hole. The space agency's Gaia spacecraft captured very small irregularities in how the star orbited and those irregularities were caused to some kind of unseen gravity. A lot of astronomers love looking back in time and they did the same thing with this uh, system. How and why and what would this system have looked like before that black hole came to be? Because remember black holes arise from the death of a star. The star that made the black hole would be about 20 times as massive as our sun. And really, really big stars, they don't last as long as smaller stars. That's something that isn't well known, but it, it's very true. In the stellar cycle, a small, small star lasts way longer than a large star. And the larger the star that you have, the quicker it quote unquote burns out. So this, the, the star that became the black hole this 20 times bigger than our star star um, would, have, would have only lasted a couple million years before it became a supergiant. So what makes this discovery puzzling and confusing and to scientists intriguing is the star that became the black hole. It would have puffed out. It would have gotten bigger and bigger and engulfed this other star. And it probably should have wrecked it, but it didn't. 
it turned in itself into a black hole, leaving the other star just hanging out. When I've talked to astrophysicists before, there's still so much we don't know about how black holes form. There's good ideas and there's good data to show there is a path that is taken is way beyond and above my pay grade to try and explain it to you. But they always say every time our telescopes look, there's also there's these this new data that comes in that's puzzling. So I can just imagine how gleeful all of the astrophysicists that study black holes are with James Webb, the Webb telescope beaming stuff back because, you know, something in the next couple years is going to just open up a can of worms on the whole idea of black holes. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, let's talk about the dog brain. Have you ever wondered what's going on inside your dog's head? I look at Bunsen and Beaker and I'm like, what are you guys thinking? <laughs> Bunsen has such expressive eyes. I know what he's thinking, at least the emotion he's feeling. But Beaker, Beaker is mysterious. When Beaker is happy, she is so happy and the world lights up around her smile. But when Beaker isn't super happy, she has Beaker face and she could play poker. We have no idea what she's thinking when Beaker face gets turned on. We just don't know. Like, what are you thinking, Beaker? Are you are you frustrated? Are you happy? Are you angry? Are you bored? We just don't know because you've got Beaker face. It's like this deadpan look. <laughs> it's so adorable. <laughs> so this study comes from the Journal of Visualized Experiments, and it was done at Emory University. So researchers got some dogs and they took fMRI uh, neural data of awake dogs and um, they were unrestrained and the dogs were shown videos for a total of 90 minutes. They took the brain scans of the dog and they fed it to an AI program to look for patterns. And what they were testing was what was in the video. So <laughs> they wanted to see what kind of video would be compelling for a dog to watch. I love this. Uh, like Bunsen doesn't watch the TV at all. So I'm not sure what kind of video they would have made for Bunsen, but Beaker likes to watch the TV. So she probably would be a good candidate. So one of the videos was basically a GoPro footage uh, from the dog's perspective of the world. So the researchers thought the dogs might be more engaged if the video they made was from a dog's perspective. So they, they attached a GoPro to the back of a dog and they took the dog on a whole bunch of different excursions that dogs will do in a day, like getting pet by people, seeing other people, receiving treats, um, playing and eating and looking at cars and bikes. And um, then they timestamped the different parts of the video, like uh, dog or cat or somebody's the dog is sniffing or the dog is eating because the idea was they wanted to see with the brain scans when the peaks were and if it coincided with the timestamp of novel activity on the video. You see where I'm going with this? It's actually a pretty good study. Now, you might be wondering how accurate this AI program is and mapping brain da data um, into some kind of like pattern. They say it's 99% accurate with humans, uh, but it was perhaps a little less for the dogs. Now, one of the interesting things is that from the data, it really appears that dogs and humans' brains uh, work differently or dogs really key into things differently than humans. When compared to a human watching the same video, so they also had humans get their brain scanned, humans were way more interested in things that were objects. So people were really interested in seeing videos of objects. Dogs were not at all concerned with who they were looking at or what they were seeing, but boy, did they like action. Anything that was moving, anything that looked like it was an animal moving, had the highest peaks or the highest pattern within the brain scans. So different than humans. Example might be in the video, a human is holding a screwdriver. Okay. The human would be keyed in on, whoa, what's that? Oh, it's a screwdriver. Oh, the human is, the human, I recognize him. His name is Bob the Builder. Oh, he's doing, he's screwing a thing. Now the dog may not be concerned with any of that, <laughs> but if Bob the Builder started to run or 
you know, through the screwdriver, something action oriented, that's where the the AI program noticed a big spike in brain activity. I do have to break a little bit of uh, the study down in a not so nice way. The amount of <laughs> the amount of dogs that had their brain scanned in the study was two, two dogs. You might say, why didn't they use more dogs? Think about the task these dogs were asked to do. Astronomical for the average dog. They had to sit and have their brain scanned and watch a video for 30 minutes. So they weren't tied down or anything, but that is an awful lot of concentration. There is no way Beaker would be able to do that test. <laughs> she would she would be a failed out participant. It is really wholesome data. I love the idea of the study. It makes sense that dogs are predatory in nature, so they're going to be keyed in on things that are moving. But it is cool that science is figuring out more about how a dog's brain works and what they're thinking. That's pet science for this week. Hey everybody, before we get to the interview section, here's a couple ways you can help the science podcast out. Number 1, if you're on any place that rates podcasts, give us a great rating. Tell your friends and share it with people who love science and pets like teachers. Number two, think about signing up as a member of the Paw Pack. It allows you to connect with people who love our show and it's a way to keep the show free. Number three, check out our merch store. <laughs> we have the Bunsen Stuffy 2.0. There's still some Beaker Stuffies left. They're adorable as well. Warm cuddly clothes and adorable drinkware the link is in the show notes okay back to the interview section it's time for ask an expert on the science podcast and i have eddie guo medical student with us today how are you doing today eddie i'm doing fantastic how are you i'm so good i'm very excited to talk to you about about what's coming up later in the interview because i was on linkedin and the university of alberta had this amazing video and I was like, whoa, we got to talk to these people. Um, but before we get that far, where are you calling into the podcast from? I maybe gave it away a bit. Oh, yeah. I'm from, well, I'm from Edmonton. Mm -hmm. And I recently just came to Calgary two months ago and just started medical school here. Okay. So you are you grew up in Edmonton? Um, that's your That's your home base? Or have you moved around? So I've been all over the place. I was born in Toronto. Um, okay. Then shortly after that, went to China for three years to live with the grandparents while my parents okay. uh, found jobs. And we just happened to end up in Edmonton. And so I consider myself an Edmontonian, grew up there for for the better part of two decades. And now we're here in Calgary. So definitely an Edmontonian at heart. <laughs> Calgary might be a little warmer in the winter. Edmonton's quite... I'm from Red Deer and a couple hours north. That makes a big difference. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's so warm here. I'm looking forward to the Chinooks. We didn't yeah, get the so Chinooks much. Come through, you bet. My brother lives in Calgary and we're always so... I mean, you could it could randomly snow and drop a hideous amounts of snow, but then you do get those <laughs> Chinooks a little more than you do in Edmonton. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Eddie, could you talk to us a little bit? We kind of gave it away that you're a medical student. Could you give uh, talk to us a little bit about your training in science? Yeah, sure. My training in science it really started in my first year of university. I, I did about two years of neuroscience at the UVA, um, okay. University of Alberta. And yep. uh, halfway through the degree, I decided to do a little transition. And so I went into engineering physics, so quite different. Um, if you want me to elaborate, I'd be happy to. And shortly after my third year of university, I uh, took the summer to do a study abroad. I went to the University of Oxford, where I did um, two graduate courses in MRI physics and stem cell engineering. Uh, came back, did another year of engineering physics, and uh, as luck would have it, I got into medical school at the University of Calgary and have just been here for the last two months. So that's a little bit about my, my training in science. I guess in terms of research or uh, relevant things for sciencey things. Um, <laughs> my research has been all over the place as well. Uh, the major domains have been biomedical engineering with the U of A story, as you alluded to, yep. with the exoskeleton. Uh, I've yep. also done a little bit, uh, published a paper uh, regarding science education. Um, that's that's a little bit of uh, with my volunteer experiences with an organization called Eureka Canada, really just helping high school and undergraduate students uh, get their feet wet with research and really just uh, seeing how we can provide 
good education for them in terms of research because I know not everyone gets the opportunity to or or has that opportunity. And then um, now my my projects have sort of branched off into various domains. Like one of them is uh, so stroke research. What we're doing is oh, we have this cool. huge data set in Calgary. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, I know it's really cool. And my job is basically to use machine learning to sort of tease apart different things within the brain scans and and see how we can make uh, patient outcomes a little bit better. And other ones are like surgery related or or social innovation related. So all across the board here, but that's a little bit about my story. I'd be happy to elaborate on any any of these. Well, we'll we'll get into the weeds on a couple of those. Um, the, The big question that I love talking to folks in science is, So you've done all this training, you have all of these cool offshoots of stuff that you've done, but where did it start, Eddie? Like, why did you go into science slash medicine? Like, were you always interested in science when you were young? Did you you build some Legos one day and something clicked? Uh, What happened? What's the story there? Right. So I think for myself, I... It's always a little curious little kid. I'd always tinker around with stuff, <laughs> take stuff yeah. apart. You know, that classic story of uh, an engineering, like a uh, student coming and being like, okay, here's a clock. I take it apart. Don't want to put it back together once I figure out how it works. So yeah, totally did the Lego, had a Lego phase, <laughs> um, had a had a math competition phase as well, just doing math competitions and, and like really seeing where things went. And so mm-hmm. I think that for me, for me science was always... Um, a major goal in my life, like just pursuing science. And then as sort of time progressed into high school, into undergraduate, um, I more and more realized some of the nuances of, of what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And what that included was something of um, something intellectually stimulating, something I could go to work every day and be like, wow, this is so cool. I want to do this for, for mm-hmm. the rest of my life. Um, and, and so I, I really do think that science was a, was a big passion and it was quite evident, like as a child, that I wanted to be in a field where I could pursue science. And yeah, that, that's just how it was just a natural path for me, um, hmm. so to say. I love that answer. Uh, I interviewed a while back Dr. Um, Andrea Damaskelli from, he works with quantum materials. And that's what he said is that he wakes up in the morning and he's just so excited because like, what's going to happen today? What are we going to learn? What are we going to do? And it sounds like you've done that with a whole bunch of different projects and what you're working on now. So that's cool. Oh, yeah, exactly. Like, I, I totally agree. Like, wake up every day. It's like, what do I want to do? I, I want to learn something. I want to be challenged. I want to contribute to, to science as well. And I think a really great thing about science is that you can find your niche. I, I was a little bit hesitant at first when I was sort of choosing and picking and, and seeing what sort of fit. And so I, I do think that science is like, it's just so broad. You, you will find your niche somewhere if you're, if you're like remotely interested, at least myself. Um, and the beautiful thing about it is you can go as deep as you want and um, it can be as hard as you want. And I, I, my, my old physics professor had this quote I loved, which was um, anything like worthwhile doing is, is, is likely hard. And hmm. I really take that to heart. Like I love the hard questions, love answering tricky things. Uh, difficult concepts, stuff that will, will will push forward, like knowledge or even my own personal knowledge. And I, I just love, just love learning, you know, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, I just love science. I love it. What a great answer, Eddie. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. <laughs> so we have to talk about, <laughs> we have to talk about this video that I was just, I, I, I made a LinkedIn account and I was like, well, I better get on LinkedIn with Bunsen and Beaker. And I checked out the University of Alberta. That's where my two degrees are from. And they were per- they had this video of this. I think it was you in a robot suit, an exoskeleton. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, dude, we have to talk to these people on the science podcast. It's like two hours away from us. And it's my former university. Um, Eddie, could you talk to us about this exoskeleton? Yeah, certainly. So perhaps I'll begin with um, the idea where it came from. Mm -hmm. Um, And just spoiler alert, just heads up, we bought the exoskeleton um, because we worked on the software side of it. Right. Okay. Um, So that's just the heads up there. Um, So for this exoskeleton, uh, basically what it is, is like, 
a skeleton outside of yourself that helps you to do tasks. So for example, for us, it was a lower limb exoskeleton mm-hmm. to really help people walk, uh, to rehabilitate. It's for people who have perhaps gone in a car crash and are injured from that car crash and really need to relearn how to walk. Mm-hmm. And the goal with our exoskeleton was exactly that because walking has a, a specific pattern to it. Like it's pretty rhythmic. Um, we thought that we could replicate these, this behavior in yeah. an exoskeleton and really help people. And I think a really good analogy that my professor, Dr. Maddie Tavacoli said was that um, what we're trying to do with it is to create a good dance partner. And what I mean by that yeah. is, uh, we want the exoskeleton to adapt to the person using it. So, for example, uh, let's say you have two cases. One of the cases is you have a dancer who's really well trained, really good, but is pretty rigid in the motion and can't really um, can't really learn to replicate their partner's movements. And that would probably not be a very good dance partner in, in the long run. And then we have the second scenario where you have someone who's willing to learn, someone who uh, can adapt to the person, maybe it doesn't have all the steps right down, but as time progresses, it keeps on learning, keeps on learning and adapts to its partner. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to use reinforcement learning, which is a subset of machine learning that captures this idea of a dance partner where you're learning how the person walks so that as you go on in the future, you can become more and more attuned with that specific user because we all have different ways we walk we all have different uh for example length of our step amplitude of our step frequency mm-hmm. of our steps and so we can't really replicate that with like a hard-coded algorithm we have to make sure that we get the exoskeleton to learn to get those little nuances of each and every individual person and so that's the that's the major idea behind our project hmm. So it starts off a little a little clunky or it starts off a little naive. And then as you go, the idea is it becomes an expert of the person in it. Mm-hmm. I think the, the word naive really captures it. So the baseline of how we train the model to start with is we have a healthy person just walk and we collect that data. Mm-hmm. And that's the baseline. So it already sort of knows how a person walks. It just needs to be attuned to an individual user using it, um, if, if that makes sense. It does. So here's a couple big questions for you around this. Um, is it fairly successful? Like, let's say, you know, God forbid somebody I love was in a car wreck and they lost the ability to use their legs. Would this exoskeleton walk for them? Or are we not quite there yet? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we already do have rehabilitation exoskeletons. Wow. Those exoskeletons currently out there on the market are available for hospitals to purchase. And the thing with them is they, they do tend to have predefined walking trajectory. So for example, if you put it on, it's not very personalized to you. It doesn't change. It's like that first partner we talked about, that first dance partner. Mm-hmm. Um, and it will help you walk. And sh- you, you certainly can walk with it. it. It does help with rehabilitation. There have been numerous studies showing the effectiveness of these exoskeletons of helping someone who's been injured in the past. What we're trying to do is really to make it personal, uh, personalized. Um, so you can still walk, but... Now what you have that is that additional layer of personalization to you, uh, the user. And that should make the experience a little bit more comfortable. Um, and we are currently running the experimental trials. Like just, just as of today, you, you called in at a good time. Um, just as of today, we got the experiments to get started. And uh, soon we should probably have some, some results out. And likely we're going to publish it either in a conference or, or a journal paper uh, very, very soon. Oh, that is so cool. Well, congratulations on that, being part of that team. Thank you. So um, what, am I right? Were you in the video wearing the thing? It depends on which video we're talking about. Okay. I was certainly wearing the video, uh, the exoskeleton in one of the videos. Okay. One of them, my my supervisor, uh, Javad, a uh, PhD student, was wearing it. And another yeah. one, I was wearing it as well. Okay. So if it was an orange shirt, I yeah, was Yeah, that it. was you. It was the orange shirt. Yeah. Yes. So how, how, what did it feel like? 
because I don't know, I don't want to presume anything, but um, I would assume you're not differently abled. You can move around. Mm -hmm. So I think for myself, um, when I was wearing it in that particular video, we didn't quite add the personalization part in. And Mm -hmm. so uh, although it did help, like it did feel like I was was like Iron Man for a little bit there. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I know. It's like every every like electrical or engineering physics uh, physics, uh, engineers like dream to be like Tony Stark but yeah, yeah it did feel a little bit like that when I first put it on uh I'm gonna be totally honest here I was like wow <laughs> catch a photo for me please um <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah so it felt like Iron Man for a little bit there but I thought it was the realization when I when I was wearing it like I was like wow this is helping me move a little bit better there's a little bit of a learning curve to get used to it because mm-hmm. I can walk and so it, it did feel a little bit awkward at first to let the exoskeleton walk Walk for me, Hmm. but it was just so cool. Like it was the synthesis really in my mind of human and machine that uh, has been like one of the dreams of mine for for a very long time. Like as a kid, I was like, I want to, I want to like do something with machines and I want to have that machine like interact with me in in a way that's like uh, really cool, like Iron Man. And and so Really, I, I thought that was an amazing experience and sort of shifting gears a little bit towards the patient side of things. I thought to myself, this this is such a powerful technology that like just in the past decade has been exploding in, in terms of the papers out there, in terms of the technology invented, in terms of the patents. And I, I just think it's just a, such a fantastic time for um, for the, re- re- the field of rehabilitation. Um, yeah. Yeah, because you see in science fiction shows, like, let's just take Iron Man out of the equation. Um, Mm -hmm. Like, even Alien, the first Alien movie, um, uh, Sergoni Weaver fights the alien in that, like, giant kind of loader mech suit thing. And then there's the Matrix Matrix movies. They have, like, those exoskeletons, Avatar. Um, What's the one with Matt Damon where he's got to get to the moon or something? Some Elysium? The Martian? Oh, um, not Elysium. Oh, Elysium, yeah, that Elysium yeah. So like they're all and every I'm not going to lie, Eddie, every time I watch those shows, I'm like this. This is kind of possible. I could see that because we already drive cars everywhere and they are an, in a sense an exoskeleton with wheels. This is just a little bit more advanced. So um, when I saw that video, I was like, we're here. It's starting. So that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. It's, uh, it's it's just so cool. So cool. Could talk about this for ages. So cool. Yeah. So what, well, my, my next question though is, is let's, let's look into the future if we can, let's dream a bit. Um, let's look 10 to 20 years from now and chat with a much older Eddie and a geriatric, uh, Jason Zakowski. <laughs> um, where do you see this technology going, being advancing to in the next decade? I think in the, the next decade, and this is like just purely speculation from my mm-hmm. side, from my well, let's do it. it's fun. knowledge, <laughs> um, but I, I foresee the algorithms that we use to personalize not just exoskeletons, but I guess for the context of, of this conversation, exoskeletons, mm-hmm. I see it as really like a partnership between human and exoskeleton. You can get into an exoskeleton and you can just walk with it. You can just go for it. Right now, the state of things is we're still trying to figure out different methods of how we can go about making different algorithms that are adaptable to the person. Mm -hmm. And these are just getting better and better every single year. And so I think that perhaps in 10 years, perhaps in 20 years, perhaps not just the people who need to rehabilitate, but people like you and I, who are perhaps like relatively able-bodied, we can get in one and be... Uh, using these exoskeletons for just like day-to-day work, for example. Um, we already have these examples with like, uh, I'm not sure if it's GM, but it was one of the um, one of the um, factory lines where workers would have an exoskeleton that sort of adapts to their arm and they can hold it up for way longer than before. Mm. And so I really do see this field exploding and uh, you can really... Um, just get into an exoskeleton and just go for it. You can just use it. And I I see that in the future for in 10 or 20 years. 
Well, it would decrease your fatigue just walking around. But like in theory, you could make an exoskeleton so you could lift extraordinary amounts of weight because there it's a hydraulic system or a machine system, right? There's no way a human is going to be ever as strong as some robotic system is going to be in a decade or even right now. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Like the amount that the exoskeleton human combination can lift is already incredible. Um, like as technology gets better, I can only imagine that you can lift heavier and heavier loads for longer periods of time. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Except when you, you just need something that doesn't run out of juice. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That was like one of the, that was the plot point of um, live, die, repeat or the edge of tomorrow with Tom Cruise, right? They had to, yeah. the, his exosuit kept running out of juice and he had to go on foot. So um, <laughs> very cool. Very, very cool. Um, uh, while, while we're talking about movies, do you have a favorite exoskeleton science fiction movie? Is there one that comes to mind? I'd imagine you've watched a few. Oh, totally. Yeah. Uh, huge nerd for these, these sci-fi <laughs> movies. I, <laughs> I'm quite partial to Avatar. I, I really okay. like the first one, like James Cameron's uh, Avatar. I was like, wow, that's so cool that they're moving with it. Also, another one, Halo. That one oh, oh. with Master Chief. Yep. Uh, not, a, not a movie per se, but definitely read the books and watch a little bit of the TV shows. And I thought that was just so cool um, <laughs> that they were able to move so fast and with, with so much power. That's yeah. a that's a maybe dream come true in like a little bit in a little bit longer time frame, but I, I yeah that's cool. More like fifty to a hundred years for the Master Chief nonsense, right? <laughs> yeah, Chris yeah, Paul, 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 like nine foot tall super soldier. How tall is Master Chief? For people that don't know what we're talking about, where we've gone into video games, Master Chief is like a super soldier from a video game. Um, isn't he a giant? Like they, he's like genetically engineered too, right? Yeah, he's huge. He's huge. Yeah. <laughs> he's like eight feet tall or something crazy. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, so back to back to science. You mentioned that you're working um, with like stroke research and, and machine learning. That kind of goes with my my question that maybe can tie like exoskeleton robotics to other stuff in medicine, and that's the use of artificial intelligence. Um, do, could you maybe get into a little bit of that with us with, you know, how it pertains to what you're working on with uh, um, strokes in humans? Yes, for sure. I'll perhaps give an overview of the different domains that we have and, and okay. maybe I'll go into specifics of, of my personal research. Sure. And so there are lots of different applications of artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, these sorts of things. Just to orient uh, people, if you don't know, artificial intelligence is the big umbrella term for all of the like computer driven decisions that we have mm -hmm. within that is a subset called machine learning um, where you we're using like statistics and uh, statistical learning really to make uh, inferences classify and make decisions intelligently mm -hmm. and then even within machine learning you'll have deeper subsets like deep learning with neural networks or reinforcement learning and, and that's just a little overview um, and so where we are at in medicine is we're transitioning into a field which is called precision medicine. So uh, what this means is we have all these different trackers, like, for example, if you have a, a watch like an Apple watch, a Samsung watch, it'll track your heart rate, it'll track uh, your caloric intake, those sorts of things. Um, and the idea is we have so much data available to us now. How can we then go and sift through, like, millions and millions of lines of just data. <laughs> like, ridiculous. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. We're just getting, the issue here is not really, can we get relevant data? It's, or sorry, the issue is, isn't, uh, can we get data <laughs> to begin with? The issue is, how do we use such a huge amount of data? Because um, we as physicians or, or as like physicians in training or even healthcare providers, um, can't do that alone. Like genetic data is like huge. Like yeah. you can't, you simply can't. No. And, and so You'd the idea is, cry here, is like, the average person yeah, would exactly. have a good cry if they saw like some kind of genetic readout, like it's just bananas. Oh yeah, totally. Like it's not, <laughs> it's not understandable by humans really, um, yeah. but you can use that data to make decisions. For example, in genomics, um, we can use certain genes that we know are associated with different pathways that um, lead to uh, different outcomes, for example, um, for example, like 
if you're missing P53, you're likely more likely to get cancers. And then we look at your other genes and say, okay, you have these other genes. How can we tailor chemotherapy to you based off your gene signature? Gotcha. That's one of the huge fields in bioinformatics. Or another thing is we have brain scans, okay? You have a stroke. How can we predict or how can we find out where that stroke is localized to? Because mm -hmm. it often takes like neurologists, radiologists, years and years and years of training to be able to just spot it quickly. And we're now getting to a point in computer vision where we can go like, hey, we have an algorithm. Great. Now we can apply this to that one case. Give me the brain scan. I'll spit you out what I think is the stroke area or the area that's lesioned. And so like these are major, major areas within within precision medicine that we're trying to address. So bioinformatics, computer vision, um, even within the area of uh, surgical education, machine learning is is making an entry into that field. And so this is a little bit of an overview of where we're at. We're going more and more personalized uh, because we realize that although we have a population distribution of different diseases, conditions, uh, clusters of symptoms that lead to certain diagnoses, um, it, it's on a population level. So it's not very personalized. We can certainly tailor it so that lots and lots of people receive benefit. But what about those edge cases, you know? And, and so we're really trying to get at that really, you come into my clinic, I want to help you like personally to be able to provide the best care possible. And, and that's, I think, the state of the field right now. Hmm. Um, as for specifics of what I do, so one of the examples that I do is currently working on a project where we have a ton of brain scans, just so much data of, of brain scans of individuals who, who have stroke. And our idea is with this, how can we predict, how can we set new standards of care? For example, like, if we have different levels of blood going into the brain, so perfusion status, mm -hmm. can we choose certain people to receive different types of care to, to have the best possible outcomes? To make this a little bit more concrete, um, say you we right now we don't really know the specific level of brain perfusion to be able to say, hey, we're going to give you a treatment because sometimes if the brain's just dead, there's nothing we can do to revive it. But... In the case where there seems to be blood a little bit going to that area, we can revive it. And it's the threshold of who receives care, who doesn't receive care. This is where machine learning can come in and say, hey, um, we have a ton of data. How do we set those standards so that more people receive the best treatment possible? And, and so this is really the idea behind this particular project. Um, with the exoskeletons, we use something called reinforcement learning. So as, as I mentioned, it's a subset of machine learning and machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And the goal here is how do we make the exoskeleton work with the person to actually go about and do their, do their daily tasks? And then how do we make that personal? Because not everyone has the same sort of movements. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think these are two concrete examples from my personal work where uh, I'm applying machine learning to predict something from it. But I, I just think it's such a powerful field. It's uh, especially in stroke within the past two or three years, things have just been exploding with machine learning, for example, like segmentation of different stroke areas or even with tumors, those sorts of things. Um, really, really expanding quickly now. Uh, and it's a really hot field. So that's a little bit about um, like a whole spectrum of things mm -hmm. um I, I know i rounded a little bit there but no it's if you so want good i have some <laughs> no so good eddie thank you mm -hmm. um i kind of feel that in like disciplines like medicine that if you're not like it might be impossible for let's say you're your gp your family doctor and you've been mm -hmm. practicing for like 20 years um somebody like you would be speaking a completely different language about how you're learning things compared to an older um, medical professional. And unless they're, I just feel like you'd get lost in the shuffle if you weren't constantly keeping up because like, I feel in 10 years, this is going to be the thing. All of this machine learning is going to push medicine to like, you, like you've been talking about such individualistic care. Um, I worry sometimes about folks that, they are not up and up with what's going on like yourself. Uh, do you have concerns like that or, or not so much? I don't know. So one thing I'll say is that family physicians, GPs, mm. they're fantastic. They keep yeah, up no, to they're date so good. They have things. to know everything. So um, perhaps to sort of allay those concerns, um, I would say that 
all the GPs, all the doctors in Canada mm -hmm. are, are governed by their provincial bodies, as mm -hmm. well as the Canadian Medical Association and, um, and the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Yeah. And so um, as a requirement of being able to practice and maintaining your license, you have to be able to firstly just keep up to date with all the new innovations that are coming out. Oh, um, you have to that is get continuing medical education credits and like undergraduate medic medical education is just the foundation of the things you learn. That changes like every few years, just changes completely because medical <laughs> knowledge is doubling every like every year, I think now, yeah. or even more than that. Yeah. And so, yes, that there, there could be concerns in terms of the progression and the speed of how things are, how things are going. But I do think that GPs, family physicians and physicians just in general in Canada yeah. are, are, are positioned really well oh, to keep good. up with those materials because they're mandated by the governing body to actually need to learn those things in addition to wanting to provide the best possible care for patients. And, and so I think that um, aspect of things is, is a little bit, it is covered. However, I do agree that things are just progressing so fast in, in the machine learning fields, in the innovation fields of medicine, um, that one really truly does need to keep up with the material. For example, I learned about a treatment for, um, for just uh, stomach troubles, like an ulcer. Like that has changed within the past 10 years. The preceptors that have come in have told us like, hey, we now use something called proton pump inhibitors rather than, for example, like H2 receptor antagonists. And um, oh, you don't really, that's not terribly important, but the, the thing I'm trying to get at is like things change and the physicians change with it. And I think that physicians are, are positioned really well to bridge this field between innovations that are happening in the in, in industry and in research, those sorts of things and transitioning that to clinical practice. And I think there are just so many opportunities for, for um, personalization, for machine learning to really improve the quality of care that we can provide. You know, maybe it was not my concern that they wouldn't know, just my concern for them that there's, mm -hmm. it's just so much work. And I know physicians are they are the diamonds in the rough of society for how hard they have to work so my hats and my total respect off to them and for keeping up to date on all of this it sounds daunting and um i'm you know just hats off to you for pursuing this as a career yourself thank you i appreciate it <laughs> wow so um we are not you do you, you do you have any fears about uh like <clears throat> the exoskeleton talking to like Meta's whistleblower that said their AI was sentient or something like that, and then making some kind of Terminator robot. Like we're th th we're we're not close to this nonsense, are we? <laughs> so the Meta thing, I feel like that was a little bit blown out of proportion. Yeah, that's um, a, <laughs> yeah. But you know, yeah, like if somebody like hears the, hears something that AI is sentient, you're like, what? Um, <laughs> not yet, please. <laughs> Exactly. Like there, there's absolutely no chance of the exoskeleton talking to Meta. Just <laughs> putting that straight out there. Um, I, I think that AI, AI picking people learning, aggressively. <laughs> yeah, I, I really do think that it, it, it's quite hyped up because, um, uh, after all, like all the algorithms we use are based out of like statistical methods, mm -hmm. uh, and so when we talk about learning, we don't really mean like the learning in terms of how you and I learn. Perhaps it's uh, parallels there, but really everything in machine learning and especially statistical machine learning, it's all based on mathematics, statistics. We have to prove different things in different cases, how it works. And um, really like, I would be amazed if sentient um, intelligence comes from that. Maybe it's an emergent thing and maybe it does happen. But I, I don't think we're, we're quite there yet. For example, our exoskeleton, very limited case. It's only for that particular case where we have an agent controlling how fast or slow you want to go. And, and it's just a number that spits out. And so um, there's this thing called generalized AI and people are working on it, like big companies like Google, like uh, uh, DeepMind, those sorts of things. And mm. they're certainly working on a general AI. But for sentience to come out of it, unless it's an emergent property of um, certainly like computational power. Um, I, I don't foresee like sentient AI becoming a real threat until much, much later. Mm. Um, yeah. I've heard that too from question. AI scientists that we're a ways away from this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
It's got the com- it's got the it's got the computing it's got the brain capacity of like a worm, um, but the worm can crunch numbers pretty good. That's the best exactly. analogy exactly. I was told. <laughs> that's a that's a fantastic analogy, exactly like that. Maybe one day we will reach the computing power of the human brain, but <laughs> even then, like the algorithms that we design are, are human algorithms, and they're based off of statistical learning. And so, whether or not sentience can arise from statistics is, is an entirely other question, but just based off the way things are going, like everything is rooted in math and stats. And so um, I I don't know if sentience will will come from it anytime soon. (laughs) Well, judging by how well I did at my my statistics 202 class in university, um, maybe AI has me beat there, but yeah, it probably is not going to (laughs) be, it's probably not going to be needing John Connor to come back in time to save us from anytime (laughs) soon. So uh, we have a couple standard questions on the science podcast. Uh, one is the pet story. We ask our guests to share a pet story from their life. So here we go. Uh, Eddie, do you have a pet story you could share with us? Pet story. So for my personal life, um, my family has grown up largely without pets. Uh, the only time we did have a pet was uh, this really cute German shepherd um, called him Alex. And we had him for about two days, which which. A little bit sad story there, but um, he was the cutest dog ever. Little puppy running around all over the house, pooping everywhere. (laughs) And uh, we we quickly realized that uh, perhaps he could be paired with a different family with with more resources uh, (laughs) to take care of them. And and so we paired them with a close family friend where they also had a a separate puppy. That's not, I thought the puppy died. I was like, oh no, Eddie. Oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 <laughs> no, no this, is, this has a happy ending, I promise. Has a happy ending. Um, yeah. and, and so we gave him away to our friend and the puppies grew up to become like really beautiful German shepherds Aww. and they're living their best lives. It is important for families like that, to, like yours, to realize that, you know, like this was, you know, very cute, but we're just, this we're not, we're just not equipped. We're all so busy. That's usually what it is, is time, right? Puppies take, puppies are a full-time job, really. <laughs> like when Bunsen and Beaker, our dogs were puppies, we got them during the summer and both my wife and I are teachers. So we had the time to do all of that. And it is, it is like having a little toddler um, <laughs> that is much faster than the average toddler. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah totally agree i think that um for for ourselves like we, we simply didn't have the time and I, I really do think to uh, these 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 dogs these pets they they really do deserve care and um mm. if if it's a situation where you can't see them for let's say 16 hours a day because you're working or, or whatnot i don't know if that's like the best environment to, to be in for, I for agree. that pet and, and so we we thought that the best decision would let them grow in an environment where they have a sibling and where they can have a really productive life with with the humans as well, the human mm-hmm. adoptees. That is a good that is a good point. That is good advice. I'm glad there was a good happy ending. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your pet story. The other question that we ask our guests is for the super fact. And the super fact is something that you know that when you tell people, it kind of like blows their mind a bit. Uh, do you have a super fact you could share with us? Super fact. This is this was one that I had to really think about because um, I didn't have one off the top of my mind. <laughs> but perhaps I'll, I'll talk about polar bears. Oh, um, something okay. that blew my mind was that although they look white, they have translucent skin, uh, translucent fur, their skin is actually black. And when I saw that, I was like, whoa, <laughs> like, I had no idea that that would be a thing. So, yeah, there we go. Polar, polar bears have, have black skin. That is not something you would expect um, <laughs> from a super white bear that lives in the white Arctic, right? There we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was lucky enough with my uh, – I've told this story before. I organized a trip for my science colleagues we flew to Churchill, Manitoba, and then we got on a tundra buggy and we went out to see the polar bears on Hudson Bay. Um, wow. And yeah, it was, that was like, it was a long day. But when we got there and we saw the polar bears for like two hours, it was like super worth it. <laughs> it was like a lineup, yeah. you know, a line at uh, Disneyland or something. And you stand in there for like four hours. And you're like, is this going to be worth it? And if it's Mr. Toad's wild ride, it is not. Um, but if it's anything else, it probably would be. So, yeah, so cool. Like, 
I don't know what it is about them. Um, they're, they're just such fascinating animals. Yeah. yeah. They look cute, but they would totally eat you and I in two seconds. And oh, totally. unless we had like some kind of like Elysium exoskeleton, we'd be toast. <laughs> <laughs> so you got to buff up your exoskeleton there before we go after the polar bears together. <laughs> I'll certainly keep that in mind, Jason. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. The last question for us, and it's a fun one. We get to know our guests a little bit more outside of what they do. Um, and we were talking before the podcast about this and uh, you wanted to talk about fencing. Now this is, That's I'm right. assuming not the fencing that I did in rural Alberta where you'd put up fences to keep cattle <laughs> out. Uh, this is the fencing with swords or rapiers yes. or whatever they're called. Yes. It is. And so, yes, I, I've done fencing since 2011. So oh. long, long time. Um, and it is exactly what you think about it. It's people with swords fighting. Um, oh. So Princess Bride, for example, ex- sort of like that. Sort of like that. It's very exciting. Do you ever quote um, uh, Miga Montoya? <laughs> you know, I back uh, when I... When I first started, I would pretend that I, I was like one of those bandits and I'd be like, on guard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Prepare to or two. So but you, I'm assuming, <laughs> did you ever fence competitively in tournaments? Oh, yeah. So oh. I, I, I did fence competitively for, for the longest time. And um, I guess my my glory moment was back in 2016, where I represented Team Canada oh. at the Guatemala Junior World Cup. for Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I, I managed to place top 32 at that competition. And that was like my crowning moment there. I was like, wow, this is great. Um, <laughs> so, yes, I did do it competitively and quite competitively. Um, for, for it looks there. so fun. I've never fenced before, but it looks like it would be fun. Like it's one of those just fun things. I'll tell you this. It is, without a doubt, one of the best workouts you'll ever get. So even if it's not fun, you're in a full body suit with a mask, with a glove, with a jacket, and you're just moving around in like a constant squat, lunging all over. So (laughs) fantastic for the weight loss. (laughs) See, um, I have done martial arts for uh, like a decade, more than a decade. And that's like Mm -hmm. um, sparring, like putting on the gear and fighting or fighting people. Not like you're UFCing, but you know. The, it is an incredible workout <laughs> to fight. It really is. Um, we yeah, never I, got I to fight that. with our swords, though. Um, I always mm. regretted that in Kung Fu. Um, we were not allowed <laughs> to fight with the broadswords because no. the, we were told that we would probably kill each other. So <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair point. That's a fair point. Yeah. Do you um, have any – did you that, invent any moves? Like do you have any – can you dish on us any Eddie – like – special moves to get points on people mm, yeah so that that's a really I, I, I thank you for asking that I, I think i do have a favorite move i don't okay. know if I, I didn't invent it but it's one of my absolute favorite moves yeah is that when someone's attacking you yeah you can parry their blade and then you can flick so what the flick is is literally the blade is bendy okay yeah. so it, it can bend like quite a bit if you're fencing uh the foil weapon and it can bend over someone's back, like literally arch over and hit them on the back. And so this is a stabbing weapon. And so if you hit enough with enough force with the flick, you can get the point. And that was like my absolute favorite move of all time. Someone's coming at you, they're rushing, you parry their blade out of the way, and then you flick them on the back. And oof, just <laughs> just like the moment you got that was like, wow, the like dreams come true, stars <laughs> flying all over the place, like. Oh, such a great feeling. Now, if that, if they, let's say you weren't wearing the protective equipment and the foil blade mm-hmm. was relatively real, would that, would you hurt somebody with that move? Like, would you, would it stab them or would it be more like somebody slapping you in the back? So if you do it properly, you shouldn't really feel it very much at all. Like it'd okay. be like someone poking you in the arm really. Oh, okay. uh, but of course, like it is a metal sword. So if you flick and you accidentally like slap the entire blade on their back, <laughs> yes, it does hurt. <laughs> but uh, another fun like fact, I guess, like baseball be. bat. Yeah, I guess you shouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that would that, that hurt a lot. I feel like a whip. But um, the I guess and really another fun fact is I don't know if this is mind blowing, but um, in fencing, depending on which level of competition you go to, will require certain 
um, levels of protection. So, for example, we we wear like Kevlar level protection hmm. at like international and national competitions. And so, uh, it's just a fun fact: you can be shot while wearing your fencing gear, depending on where what gear you're wearing, and you might have few broken bones, but you'd probably be okay. Really. Yeah, it's it's very stringent. Like we we do want to be protected. Yeah, and the protection is very very good at protecting you. That is well, I guess you're you're using swords. <laughs> <laughs> and we in martial arts, uh, one we sparred with weapons one time. The, the our sifu was like, okay, we're gonna well, let's do it. We'll spar with weapons today. So the only two weapons people were allowed to choose was the long staff, the short staff called the dune guan and the surgiquan which is the nunchuck so (laughs) i had i had the long staff because i was like i'm gonna you know use it to poke people smack people a bit (laughs) and it was we put padding on it right but it was probably really uh, not safe and then the nunchuck that um my the other guy i was going against had was foam and plastic and (laughs) it was like a foam and plastic like you, they're like nine bucks off Amazon. Like we would train with them because you want to train with that before you use the wooden one. So you don't take your teeth out. And yeah. Sifu was like, go. And he went Fwah! and he flicked it. Cause that's, you know, you flick the nunchuck and he broke my finger with this, Ooh, just ouch. broke my, in like half a second done. It was over. I was like, ah, and the Sifu was like, that's it. We're, this is stupid. Somebody's going to lose their face. So I was the guinea pig and never again did we spar with weapons in Kung Fu because, yeah, there, oh a plastic nunchuck broke my finger. So I can imagine if you had a metal sword, you don't want people to die. So <laughs> yeah. always, always like the number one priority here. <laughs> Safety. <laughs> Safety. Okay. Um, Eddie, we're at the end of our chat today. And wow. Um, this was so fascinating and fun. So thank you for agreeing to be a guest on the Science Podcast. Thank you for having me. I, I really enjoy talking about science and just sharing science. So thank you so much, Jason, for having me on your show. You betcha. Um, so if John Connor does arrive tomorrow, then we're going to have a little chat about how we're wrong about <laughs> AI. Um, and then you, and then we'll probably have to talk about buffing up your exoskeleton <laughs> to, to fight Terminator robots. So. <laughs> absolutely john Con- john connors comes you know who to call okay sounds good that i will i will hold you to that sir <laughs> all right okay it is time for story time with me adam if you don't know what story time is story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past one or two weeks uh dad do you have a story oh boy well my story is about going solo with the dogs outside into the snow it's had, we've had really weird weather lately where it's been warm and it has been warm and then it gets freezing cold at night and everything solidifies. So you get melt and then freeze and then melt and then freeze, which means that 99% of everything outside is like a skating rink. This is not good for me being a bipedal human, but for the dogs, it's a lot of fun. I took the dogs, I took the dogs snowshoeing today. And Bunsen was roaring around like he was a puppy again. And, you know, he's not a young dog anymore, but he sure looked like he was a young dog today. He was just like roaring around and then jumping into the snow and burrowing his head and smushing his face along the the icy sharp ice, like doing some kind of face face, face wash business. I don't get it. I think it's fun to him. And there's no way I can keep up with him. If he wanted to run away, he could. I can't. There's no way I can move as fast as him in the snow. And that's with my big snowshoes on. Um, So uh, they just, you know, Bunsen's just in his element, blustering wind today. The wind is, you know, blowing his snow majestically. And Beaker's eating snow and Bunsen's roaring around. Um, It really, it really makes you feel... (laughs) even though the weather has been weird and then it was cold and windy today, it sure makes you feel good watching how, how much fun the dogs have in the snow. So that's my story. I sure do. I was trying to keep the dogs very quiet while you were telling your story, Jason, because yes, Bunsen now is saying you are sitting down at your computer and 
he likes to talk. So I opened up the bark box and there's, it's a Thanksgiving theme. And the, one of the toys is called the gobbler. And the other one is called squeak potato fries. But neither of those toys are as exciting as me sitting at the computer because now Bunsen is right beside me. The other story is that we have been packing up the Bunsen Stuffy 2.0s to send to our customers. And the minute we opened up the large Amazon box with nothing inside, Ginger jumped in. And Ginger jumped in and was like, if I fit, I sit. And Beaker was like, nope. I don't like those shenanigans, and it was just a, a interesting and funny time, and it <laughs> reminded me of the cat scientist that we had on uh, the space, the oh. Twitter space, um, just saying, you know, that they like to go into boxes, and it doesn't matter what size, when the, it opens up, the cat will find it. So that's my story. The dogs were very concerned that Ginger was in the box. They did not know. They did not know how she got in there. They did not know why she was in the box. I think they thought it was very weird and scary. So they were very concerned while Ginger was in the box. And my story is about Ginger as well. Um, and my story is about Ginger escaping. If you didn't know, Ginger did escape uh, from our home outside for like four hours. Maybe it was crazy. Uh, I was gone to uh, an event, a a jazz cafe event, um, and mom and dad went out for uh, supper. So the house was all alone, and what we think happened is that Ginger got into the garage while dad was doing uh, beaker stuffies or while one of us was getting outside or something happened, Um, but she got into the garage, and then we left in the car, and then she got out through the garage and was just prowling around outside for the greater part of four hours. Um, yeah, it was really big of a uh, event trying to find her. Uh, looked throughout the entire house, couldn't find her. And then just by a stroke of luck, uh, mom was walking around outside and saw Ginger. Um, so then she came back inside. And I'm very happy to have her back because she's a good kitty and I love her. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so she's back. She's fine. Uh, the dogs were concerned about where she went. And Beaker was very sniffy. Like, where'd you go? Why did you leave? <laughs> yeah, when when Ginger came back in the house, they were really happy to see her, I think. Yeah, because they were like, where's, where's a friend? Where's our little furry friend that sometimes hits us? Um, <laughs> it's a, love, it's a love-hate actually, relationship. Just actually, Bunsen was coming to see me and Ginger was sitting there and she swatted at him because that's what <laughs> she does. Well, Bunsen's about like 80 times bigger than Ginger. You got to think, if some big thing was coming at you, I mean, you wouldn't hit it, but... <laughs> kind of scared. Bunsen Bunsen is terrified of Ginger. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny because Bunsen's so much bigger, and yet Ginger governs where he goes. If he, she's in the doorway, he doesn't go through the doorway. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, that is that is story time. Thank you guys so much for listening to this uh, podcast episode and this section of story time. I'll see you on the next one. Bye bye. That's the end of another Science Podcast episode. Special thanks to our guest, Eddie Guo, who talked to us all about the robotic suit and also some really interesting perspectives in medicine. At this time, we'd like to give a shout out to our top tier Pop Hack members. They make the podcast possible and a whole bunch of other stuff. Chris, take it away. Elizabeth Bourgeois, Peggy McKeel, Mary La Magna Writer, Helen Chin, Holly Burge, Sandy Brimer, Brenda Clark, Andrew Lynn, Marianne McNally, Karen Beth St. George, Catherine Jordan, Tracy Domingu, Diane Allen, Julie Smith, Terry Adam, Shelley Smith, Jennifer Smathers, Laura Stephenson, Tracy Leanbaugh, Courtney Proven, Fun Lisa, Ben Rathert, Jody Ogren, Brianne Haas, Bianca Hyde, Debbie Anderson, and Uchida, Donna Craig, Amy C., Susan Wagner, Kathy Zerker, and Liz Button. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Uh.